get real tools. Uh, what are they really? Um, the get real tools assume that whoever's watching this uh, broadcast right now is a Christian or a believer. They've been saved. They've accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior. I think it would be a mistake to make that assumption because what we're involved in even more today it seems like than any other time um, because of the crisscross denominational lines what many call gray areas um, the lack of doctrinal understanding uh, it's I call it identity theft in my book get real are you relevant and in this series of get real tools what I'm doing is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you step by step through tools that are in the Bible uh, to help you to be effective at reaching other people for Jesus Christ. But in order to do that, we need to make sure that we have a relationship with Christ first. I think that would be the first step. So the question I ask you, and it's the first chapter of my book, is are you a son of God? And what does it mean to be a son of God? I'm just going to briefly touch on this, really. Uh, the rest of it's in my book. But the Bible says in John 1, 1, uh, 1, 12, and 13, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So what does, what does this spiritual life mean? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Do you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that you're a son of God? Now let me briefly walk you through the four sons of gods in the Bible when you study it. The first sons of God were angels. In Job chapter 2 and verse 1, and Job 38 and verse 7, it talks about the sons of God. They were with Jesus before the creation of the earth. In fact, they were celebrating with him when he did that. So, and then the sons of God presented themselves with Lucifer, with Satan, who was the same person, before God in the temptation of Job. So, the sons of God originally, number one, were angels. They had a specific purpose, and many followed the leadership of Lucifer, Prior to his rebellion, they followed his uh, usurpation of the throne of God, or his attempted usurpation, and they failed in that attack on the throne of God. So today, they're fallen angels. They used to be part of the heavenly throne, who worshipped God, and Lucifer was the head of all those sons of gods. So, the first sons of God were angels. They had a commission to glorify God through the universe, they failed. The second son of God was Adam. In Luke 2.38, it tells us that, that Adam was a son of God. A son of God is an entity that's brought into life by a special creative act. You have to understand that as you're studying it out. Son of God number two was Adam. He was a special creation. He didn't have a physical mom and dad. He was, he was created. He was a special creation of God. He was a son of God. And he had a purpose. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. They were, he was given that commission before he followed Eve in the sin of eating of the knowledge of the tree and good and evil. He had a commission, be fruitful and uh, multiply and replenish the earth. He failed in that commission. Then there was a third son of God. You don't see another son of God in the Bible unless it's referring to the previous angel sons of God. You don't see another son of God until Jesus. Jesus was born of a special creative act. He was born of a virgin. The reason he was born of a virgin is because a child receives his blood through the Father. That's why he couldn't have an earthly father. And in fact, in Acts 20, 28, it tells you that Jesus had God's blood. It was not earthly blood. It was heavenly blood. It wasn't tainted by sin. That's why the virgin birth is so necessary. That's why the Gnostic attack that Jesus uh, and Mary got married and all of the Gnostic attempts to make Jesus just like any other earthly man and to question the uh, virgin birth of Christ, that's why that's so detrimental to uh, truth. It had to be a virgin birth so the, the sinful bloodline of man would not infect 
Jesus Christ, and He indeed can become our propitiation or our satisfaction uh, to approach God through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone. He did not fail in His commission. And He equipped 12 men, disciples if you would, He equipped 12 men to spread this message throughout the whole world about Himself, about Jesus Christ being the Savior of the world. So the fourth sons of God are you and I, hopefully you and I. When you accept or I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, our personal Savior, we are placing our faith and trust that Jesus Christ is who He said He was, who He said He is, that He is, a, he is God, he came to this earth in human form, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, he gave himself up to the cross, he died and was buried and rose again so we could have new life, so we could have eternal life. I cannot have access to God, I cannot have access to eternity except through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it was a bodily resurrection. Don't let anybody tell you it was just a spiritual resurrection, that the only reason that Jesus uh, came to this earth was to show us how to free ourselves from this physical bondage and, the, and that we could, all could be gods one day. That's what the Gnostics teach. The Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Thomas, and all those Gnostic Gospels that we don't know who the authors were. The time frame was about 180 to 200 years after uh, Jesus Christ. Um, they weren't supported by any of the New Testament writers. We do not accept the Gnostic Gospels as truth. They diverge in so many different ways. But a lot of people are buying into it. So that's why I don't take this for granted. Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Do you believe He is God? He came to this earth, died on the cross, rose from the dead for you and I. If you were the only person on this earth, Jesus would have died for you. He loves you that much. So are you a son of God? Did that spiritual uh, life happen? I remember uh, I was witnessing to uh, Johnson. And when I first started witnessing to him, he said, I'm not going to accept Christ alone. I'm just going to add him to my plethora of beliefs to make sure I don't miss out. And I started with him in discipleship. The first book is Salvation. So I knew I couldn't get to the second book, which is eternal um, uh, confidence of your salvation, the assurance of your salvation, because you can't go there unless you accept Christ. So... I stayed in lesson one for eight weeks. We, we exegeted every verse about salvation. And I went to a pastor's conference after the eighth week. He wanted to come with me in Kansas City. So he came with me. We got back. We went to our next discipleship lesson. He said, wait a minute, I can't go any further. I said, why? He said, I'm not saved. I said, what are you going to do about that? He said, I need to get saved. I need to ask Jesus Christ in my heart. I said, you know what that means, don't you? He said, yeah. He said, that means I put away everything else and only place my faith in Jesus Christ. I said, I believe you've already done that because it's a heart decision. Salvation is not saying a prayer. Salvation is not intellectually understanding something. Salvation is not knowing a Roman road. And even a lost person can lead someone to Christ. My dad led people to Christ, and he wasn't even saved. The Word of God is not going to return void even if a lost man uses it. So it's none of those things. It is, it is internally, spiritually, in your mind, placing your faith and trust, trust in Christ. He's my only way to have eternal life. He's the only way to have my sins forgiven. He's the only way I can have fellowship with God. He's the only way I can have eternal life. So I asked Johnson, I said, I want you to pray. And this prayer is not for your salvation. I believe you've already done it. And I walked him through the verses to make sure he knew what he was doing. But I said, I want you to pray. And you, you should have heard that prayer. I mean, it is evident in his life, in his life after that point, that he placed it, he's a son of God. He placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you that question right now. Are you a son of God? In my book, in the end of the first chapter, I have a couple questions. And I want to ask you this right now. And because it's not going to help you to go any further in these Get Real Tools series if you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you're just playing a game. 
So number one, you got to realize everybody is a sinner. Romans 3.23, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.25, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation or satisfaction through faith in His blood. Remember why the blood is so important. To declare His righteousness for the remission or the taking away of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And there's a penalty of sin. We're all sinners. We're born sinful. I know when my children were born, we didn't have to teach them to do right. I mean wrong. <laughs> Sorry. We didn't have to teach them to do wrong. They did that naturally. We had to teach them to do right. So Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ died to give us eternal life. Romans 5.8 But God commendeth or gave His love toward us through Jesus Christ. In that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the Bible says in verse 9 of Romans 8, Much more than being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. And in verse 10 says, We're, re we're reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. So my question today is, will you surrender to His love for you today? Romans 10, 12 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon His name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, that's everybody. God says, I would have all men come into repentance. I'm not willing that any should perish. There's a lot of beliefs going around today about should we witness, should we not witness. God knows he's going to get saved anyway. But we can't get away from this fact. God says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. He told his disciples and us through them, As my Father sent me, even so send I you. He says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He says, We're ambassadors for Christ. He says, We're reconcilers of the word of God to the world. There is no question Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord and says, I place my faith and trust in you today. I'm not going to play the game. I don't get saved by going to church. I don't get saved by tithing. I don't get saved by knowing all these things. I'm going to give my heart, my mind to you, Jesus. I understand without you, I have no access to God. I have no access to eternal life. So I want to ask you that question. And I'm going to ask you this. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and take advantage of the Get Real tools that I'm going to be offering in sequence, I want you to contact me at v2tm at rocketmail.com. That's V as in Victor, 2, T as in Tom, M as in Mark, at rocketmail.com. Let me know you choose to accept Christ, and I'll walk you through the process. You can start our free online equipping, our discipleship, lesson by lesson, online free. I'd love to offer that to you. So I, d I just want to take this first session, not take anything for granted. And I hope that if you're not a Christian, you'd accept Christ today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. The word salvation in Hebrew means the right way. So today is the day to do the right thing. And if you are a Christian, as Paul, when Satan was sifting him as wheat or desired to sift him as wheat, the Bible says Paul was converted. That conversion wasn't the salvation situation. It was that point in their life where they were saved, but they'd been, he had been playing the game. And that was the point that there was no turning back. He was converted. He, there was no turning back. From that point on, he started serving Christ from his whole heart. And if you are a believer and you haven't been doing that, I encourage you to do that. Thanks for the time you've given today.